research project was uh, in relationship to adapting cover crops uh, to a northern region. Um, we are located just north of Duluth uh, by about 30 miles. So in northern Minnesota, south, yeah, south, north of here, a long ways. Uh, and so uh, in relationship to that, um, I'd like to have Abe introduce uh, himself and a little bit about his operation. I'm Abe Bach. I'm uh, from Sturgeon Lake, Minnesota. Uh, ever since I graduated from the University of Wisconsin River Falls, I have been full time on our uh, beef uh, cow calf operation. Uh, we have uh, strived to uh, market uh, beef directly to customers, and as the grass fed beef market expands, we have uh, begun to do some of that. Uh, not all of our genetics uh, have matched that market, so we're trying to address that, but more importantly, we feel that it's our uh, access to high quality forages uh, later into the season that is holding us back in that regard. And then uh, my wife and family farm um, uh, in Barnum, and we do cow-calf, have some of the similar goals to Abe uh, in relationship to doing uh, direct marketing of grass-fed beef. Uh, and that really was kind of the um, interest in looking at and adapting uh, our system into the aspects of utilizing cover crops in our region. In addition to that, one other farmer that we had involved um, was a more conventional grain farmer. Um, he was located um, up near Floodwood, Minnesota, and uh, was utilizing um, uh, wheat, canola, and also growing some very short season corn varieties. And so in relationship to that, he was the third uh, farmer in this process. Uh, this is a, a picture of our uh, field day. Uh, we had a, this is the site of our two year study. Um, the first year we had uh, oats and peas, then we uh, harvested that. The conditions were right where I made uh, dry hay, round baled it. Then we came in the fall with the winter rye and uh, purple top turnips. Some of the data collection that we were looking at were uh, things in relationship to nutrients and biology. Um, what implications did the cover crop have on um, those soils? Uh, if we could produce a forage of quality after our primary crop was harvested uh, so that it could continue to uh, produce um, uh, a crop and sustain quality long enough so that the cattle, as they were consuming it, would uh, continue to uh, uh, grow well and uh, put finish on. And so we looked at yield and quality in relationship to that. And then we uh, put those numbers into um, um, a cost analysis. Okay, as I stated earlier, uh, we had the peas and oats, and then we came in uh, turnips at three pounds per acre and the winter rye at three quarters of a bushel per acre and a quarter bushel of peas. That is a 2014. In 2015 we removed the peas because we really didn't see much growth of the peas in the mixture uh, and so we uh, kept the turnips the same at three pounds per acre uh, and I apologize, it should be one bushel of winter rye uh, per acre in relationship to that. Um, there were a little bit differences in, in iterations with the three different farmers in the second year. Um, in uh, uh, my case, I actually no-till drilled that into the ground, and then Abe, he took a much different uh, approach. Yeah, we, I had a back injury and uh, last early summer so I got backed up on work and uh, the winter right kind of got a got out of hand and it's like well maybe we'll uh, combine it well I couldn't find anyone to do that so as well 
We'll cut her with the disc bind, open up that swath real wide, and uh, we'll see what kind of seed disbursement we can get. It worked really well. Uh, I baled up the, I raked up the windrows and baled it, and then I came with a, a finishing disc, lightly disced it, uh, then came in with the fertilizer, uh, 30 pounds of AMS, 100 pounds of potash with the 3 pounds of uh, purple top turnips mixed in with the fertilizer, broadcasted that, and then proceeded to drag it. And then we got a timely rain about a day later, and it, uh, it worked very well. In relationship to that, we collected yield data on the growing cover crop. Uh, following that, um, basically at time of when we'd get a, a snow or when we were uh, about to graze that, the data that is um, presented in this uh, um, slideshow is data collected at uh, the same time in both uh, the 2014 and the 2015 data. This here is a, a photo of some peas and oats, uh, uh, peas and oats growing. This would be a primary crop actually at Abe's place and uh, in 2014, uh, very comparable in 2015 here on our place. In 2015, um, um, this photo was taken. Uh, it was uh, a picture of us grazing um, cattle uh, as uh, mob stock, um, uh, the peas and oats. Um, in Abe's, they, uh, he actually bailed his up uh, as dry feed. Yes, that first year in 2014. This here would be uh, an interceding uh, occurring after the uh, peas and oats occurred in 2014. And then that was uh, actually um, 8.30 of 2015 this year. Um, Abe pointed out um, this year as we looked at this, um, this area had been um, an area where we uh, had utilized uh, some supplement um, during its uh, initial grazing and the cattle had um, uh, beat up that area, but a majority of it look like the uh, remaining fraction there of the stubble where it was. This here was uh, a photo. So the uh, uh, winter rye and turnips was planted on 830, um, which I would uh, generally recommend trying to get that done sooner. Um, we had a very unique fall this year in that it was very warm, very moist, uh, and so we had a uh, tremendous amount of growth. Um, the strips were um, uh, due to um, <clears throat> operator error. Uh, and uh, I give, my uh, give the credit in my case to my son. He uh, did all of the planting and he's um, 14 this year. So I give him a little bit of latitude to do this. Otherwise it may not have gotten done. So um, that was a photo of uh, 921 of this year. And then uh, that's a picture of my daughter's feet and uh, that was on 1010. And what was interesting is due to the season it just continued to grow. Um, it was unreal, uh, the growth. Um, that is a photo um, also on that same day looking up the hill. Um, you can see in the background we had bales. Um, uh, in this particular instant uh, set out for bale grazing on the edge and with this high quality of feed we actually strip grazed it allowing them to consume hay and uh, a portion of the field um, as a supplement to the hay to boost the protein. I think that um, the key to um, helping make this work even better is that um, the material is very, very high in moisture, very high quality, but utilizing it as a supplement to hay to get um, the animals to be able to consume enough dry matter at the same time is extremely valuable in relationship to that. Um, this is a photo uh, taken on the 23rd um, um, of November. 
uh, when we started grazing and so um, we had just pulled them off of some other pasture, brought them in and um, would give them the equivalent of two days of feed. Um, last, uh, this morning I did some calculating and they were consuming on average of approximately three to four pounds of dry matter of the winter rye and turnips and approximately 30 to 35 pounds of uh, dry hay at the same time through this process. And so we would uh, strip all the way across the field perpendicular to um, the hay and basically move them every other day in that process and, um, and was, was able to uh, manage that um, pretty nicely in that manner. 2014, you want to cover the yields, Abe? Eh? On uh, the Salzer farm, um, Troy's got quite a bit better nutrient availability, higher fertility in his, uh, in his ground, and it's uh, very obvious there is total dry matter, uh, 3.46 tons per acre and on my place. 0.77 on Peterson's 1.48 tons per acre. Abe also hosted um, a tour in the fall of 2014 and a component that um, um, Abe's quite modest. Um, I'm very lucky to uh, have the opportunity to work with Abe in this respect. But he did something kind of unique uh, on another portion uh, of a field uh, he went ahead and planted um, a similar cover crop, but what he did is he went out there with just um, garden um, rainbirds, and he put on about an inch of rain on that area. And for me, it was extremely interesting in that it, it increased his cover crop yield, which would be um, this column here. That's the yield of the cover crop. This was the primary uh, crop. Um, and in Abe's case, he increased the yield of the cover crop almost to four. It was like 3.92 uh, tons of dry matter per acre with one application of rain, water, um, irrigation. Uh, and so I think that the folks out there that do have the opportunity to irrigate stuff have uh, two distinct advantages. One. It allows you to plant perhaps later and still achieve very, very respectable yields in that process. And um, secondly, to get those sort of yields also gives you a, a significant advantage in relationship to um, the potential to produce forage late season of very high quality and allow you to extend your grazing season in that process. Uh, and I think that in some respects that shows through in relationship to how our yields turned out in year two or 2015. Okay, um, again on the Salzer farm, uh, Troy outperformed both the Mock and Petersons with uh, 4.94 total tons per acre. And on our farm, the three around three ton per acre in the Petersons. Uh, corn was a 3.39 tons per acre. Sauls had oats and peas. We had winter rye, Peterson, corn. Part of um, Scott Peterson's uh, situation is that he utilized the corn, um, was going to graze it off, um, and he grazed it at that sort of yield, but it pushed back his planting date on his cover crop so far that in essence the stand was very irregular. There was a few spots that were very good um, but a majority of the field was not very good. In conjunction with that they had received several uh, rain events throughout the course of the fall and we have a soil moisture uh, meter uh, and when I was out soil testing in fall at Scott's place, uh, it, um, I think only one spot did it not peg out, and that means that it's over 50% moisture in the ground. And so, in essence, it was flooded 
a majority of the time that he had that seed in the ground um, throughout that whole fall growing period. Uh, and so that was um, partially due to that, I would say, it most likely contributed to what I would consider nearly a crop failure in that particular instant. In regards to the economics, um, in 2014, um, the yields uh, there are repeated for the uh, cover crops, 1.14 ton, 1.2 ton at Abe's, Peterson's at uh, 0.3, um, cost per acre, uh, that 43.40. Uh, in Abe's case, I give Abe a tremendous amount of credit. Uh, he keeps very detailed records of the amount of time it takes him to um, prepare fields, the cost, the fuel, all of those sort of components are calculated in there. And his cost was almost $54, whereas in our case and in Scott's case, we use the Iowa uh, custom rates numbers in relationship to what our seeding costs um, are. Uh, at the bottom, those are the averages um, with Peterson's, with Scott's included, and without. I think it's important to look at both of those, and that's why we included it on the slide, because um, failures happen, and so therefore it's important to take that into consideration. Um, Abe pointed out something that I think is really critical. As we look at these um, opportunities to grow cover crops, I think it's important to understand that if you can have a little bit better fertility in your soils, the rate of success will increase in that perspective. So take that into, take that into account. One thing I, I struggle with on our farm is we've got very sandy, porous soils. What I've noticed is that our commercial dry urea fertilizer, uh, that plant isn't there to take it up and we get a rain, it's lost. So we're just seeing where a, a manure is the preferred uh, nitrogen source on our farm and that's what, and I just, I can't emphasize enough, have the fertility there if you want to capitalize on this cover crop um, practice. It, it just, it seems like common sense, but have the proper, have it there in the proper form that you can utilize it because it's such a challenge to build organic matter on these sandy soils. And there's nothing, if you're not growing anything, it's going to be really hard to do that. When looking at the cost analysis, um, uh, on average, uh, with the cost of the seed um, and such, uh, we took into consideration what the local market was, uh, for uh, the sort of quality that we saw here. And as a standing forage, we uh, valued at $80 a ton uh, uh, for dry matter. And it looked uh, in our cost analysis to be a net revenue of approximately $27 an acre. That doesn't include the value that it's contributing uh, to soil health and or uh, potential soil loss in this process. And so I think that those things need to be um, also considered. The economics for uh, 2015, similar uh, yield um, ranging from um, no real yield up to uh, 2.28 tons. Um, and our costs were slightly lower in our region for winter rye seed this past year. Um, and we had uh, taken the peas out of there. And so um, overall, uh, you can see that uh, the cost per ton of dry matter had gone down. Um, and so therefore, um, our net revenue per acre had increased to approximately $61 an acre. Now. The other thing, we didn't have a frost, even though we had snow, um, uh, November 23rd thereabouts, that snow left 
and we never had a terminating frost in relationship to our turnips and winter rye virtually until December 14th. Um, I'm young, old, and I don't ever remember um, a fall quite like this, and maybe Abe um, would be different. And so that yield I would not consider normal by any stretch of the imagination. It just kept growing and growing. It was awesome. It was so much fun. Um, and so I, I think this may be an anomaly, but um, I think that it's important to look at or consider uh, those components. In relationship to uh, crop analysis, these were scissor cut clippings taken, and that's how we analyzed all of our uh, yield data. Um, the scissor cut clippings ranged in protein from about 16 to 21 percent crude protein, very, very high. Our digestible dry matter was about 70, and our, um, our relative feed value was in that 200 range. And then this year, um, it would be uh, pretty comparable, uh, about 18% crude protein, 70% uh, digestible dry matter, and about uh, just over 200 relative feed value, extremely good, should be considered a, um, a supplement. And then uh, finally, uh, in relationship to our soils data, um, the um, F9 is uh, our field and EH is APES, and then that's uh, treatment and control. And probably the thing that I would like to point out is um, if you look at nitrate, nitrogen availability in the treatment at our place, 41, versus control where there's no cover crop growing, 56, that's 15 pounds of available nitrogen after a very wet, rainy fall where there was probably a lot of nitrogen moving through as it is. We are seeing um, basically a, a, an uptake by the crop. And then the same is true of the sulfur. And so in relationship to that, I think it's um, really critical to think about what we're doing in relationship to environmental benefit in regards to those components. The other thing that we still are um, not uh, fully aware of um, in the Salvita or the carbon dioxide burst test, um, we had excessive numbers. Uh, we went back to the lab and said, is there a decimal place that moved here or something? Um, and they said, no, that, that was the case. Um, and so, honestly, that is something that we really need to look further into. Those numbers are uh, huge. Um, and so, that's something that we would love to get feedback from or have interest in regards to that. With that, we'd be happy to take any questions. So, um, the question was, uh, in relationship to the nitrate nitrogen level, um, when looking at that and comparing those components, um, what is that demonstrating? And so um, as I look at this data, it was a soil test that was collected at the same time we were collecting the uh, scissor cuts in fall. Okay, And so with that in mind, um, there was less potential nitrogen in the treatment where the cover crop was growing, uh, available for it to be washing through the soil. And the same is true of the available sulfur in that um, top six inches of, uh, of uh, soil. Um, the other component is as we dug down, we had roots that were 16, 18 inches deep on that um, winter rye and turnips um, this, this fall. And so it really did grow well. The question was, did we look at compaction in association with um, grazing versus uh, um, the components of uh, uh, just harvesting naturally with um, harvest equipment? And I would say that 
Um, our soils are significantly different um, between Abe's and mine and Scott's. And so um, I would say that our bulk densities on the lab report um, were not of what I would consider compacted soil. Um, so I, I, I can't really address that between our different options. For me, I don't have equipment to harvest forage, and Abe and Scott have that opportunity, and so we just don't manage it as such. But that would be an interesting component to take into consideration. Yep. Okay. So the question was, did we calculate the economic benefit of the the forage production. And I would say we didn't calculate it directly, but indirectly when comparing it to what um, the um, uh, local uh, hay markets were and utilizing a figure of 80 tons of dry matter per ton of dry matter. Um, yes, it's scissor cuts. And so I know that that is artificially higher than what you would harvest with livestock. But even if you're looking at 75% of it, um, the range was um, about $27 of net benefit to that $61 of net benefit. In my case, uh, the, the, the production was rather low, and then it combined with the, the wet conditions, uh, wanting that winter rye to establish and come back in the spring. I chose not to graze it because there wasn't much uh, tonnage there and I didn't want to destroy the field with the, the traffic from the cattle. So in that sense uh, we weren't able to capture what Troy was able to with uh, grazing his cattle. Um, and getting into the beneficial uh, aspects of what we're doing with the soil, the, the microbiology, we don't really have a handle on that yet.